Hi everybody. The name of our project is In Pursuit of Interpretable, Fair, and Accurate Machine Learning for Criminal Recidivism Prediction. My name is Caroline, and the other members of our team are Bin Han, Bridge Patel, and Feroz Mohadeen. Finally, we're supervised by Professor Cynthia Rudin, who researches interpretable machine learning. Bin, Bridge, Feroz, and I will all be narrating parts of this video. All over the world, statistical models are used at various stages of the justice system to assess a defendant's risk of recidivism, that is, their risk of committing another crime. They're often used at the pretrial stage to help judges decide if a person should be held in jail or released until trial, and in some states, they've become a replacement for the bail system. Many of these models are publicly available, but some very widely used models are not. Every day, black box models are making life-changing decisions in the justice system. But there are lots of problems with using black box models in criminal justice. First, defendants and judges don't know how or why people are assigned certain scores, which is an issue that's even been brought to court. Second, score computation can't be checked for mistakes. These problems came to a boil in 2016 when ProPublica, an investigative news organization, accused Compass, a for-profit secret model, of racial bias. Although ProPublica's analysis was deeply flawed, this incident led to a renewed interest in interpretable and fair machine learning and was one of the motivations behind our project, which Bridge will introduce now. Thank you, Caroline. So our goal is to use machine learning to provide a transparent, interpretable, and fair model which performs about as well as black box models and actually surpasses currently used risk assessments in performance. Risk scores for criminal justice started as far back as the 1930s. These models were manually created by criminologists and statisticians and were usually at integer coefficient point scores. The Arnold PSA is an example of a more modern point score developed in 2013. On this slide is the new violent criminal activity score. The features of the Arnold PSA that we liked and wanted to emulate are that the model is sparse, so it's easy to understand in a glance, computed by back of hand calculations, and has positive integer coefficients. So we limit our discussion to a few works that use interpretable machine learning to predict criminal recidivism. The first people here use modern machine learning methods that globally optimized over the space of sparse linear integer models. And the second paper created a simple scoring system by rounding logistic regression coefficients, which helped address stop and frisk for the New York Police Department. Lastly, the third paper used classical decision trees to build a simple screener for the forecasting of domestic violence for the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. Our work actually considers both interpretability and fairness. We compare models across regions and our data sets are more modern than the ones in previous works. We also use modern interpretable machine learning methods, most of which were designed in the last couple of years. The data sets we use were from Broward County, Florida and Kentucky. The data included case information, demographic data, criminal history, failure to appear, sentencing and probation information. And we also analyzed at the person level, which included prior arrests, prior times on probation and in jail, and demographics such as age and gender. Our prediction task was whether or not someone would recidivate within a period of time, which is supervised binary prediction problem. We had 12 binary labels, six types of crimes, and two time scales, two year and six months for each type of crime. The six we picked were the most balanced slash most common types of recidivism to predict. For evaluation, we used area under the receiver operating curve or AUC because our models are risk assessment tools, which means they produce a estimated probability of recidivism. So our study can be divided into three parts. In the first part, we compare the performance of the black box and interpretable against the performance of existing actuarial risk assessments, namely COMPASS and the PSA. Next, we assess how well our models generalize across locations because risk prediction models are usually used at different locations than they were developed. Finally, we assess the fairness of the models according to our fairness definitions that we have selected from the many different definitions that have been proposed recently. The different models we use all provide probabilistic estimates. We divide them into two categories. One, baseline models, which are the standard ML methods listed on the left in blue, as well as Compass and the PSA in red. So for Compass, we only use it on Broward because Kentucky uses the PSA and doesn't have Compass at all in their data. 
Random Forest, XGBoost, and SVM are black box ML methods that produce functions that are too complicated to put on a uh, PowerPoint slide. On the other side of the slide, we have interpretable models being explainable boosting machine, additive stumps, risk slim, and classification and regression trees. All models were trained using nested cross-validation. Now here is Ben with interpretable models, performances, generalization, and fairness definitions. I'll start with one of the interpretable machine learning algorithms first, called additive stumps. Additive stumps model is L1 penalized logistic regression applied to binary stumps. The binary stumps data are generated by cutting continuous features at certain threshold values. For instance, the age feature ranges from 18 to 70. We pick the threshold values of 20, 24, 30, etc., and use the less than or equal to criteria to generate the stumps. The additive stumps models use fewer original features than the models constructed with vanilla L1 penalized logistic regression. The models are also flexible and nonlinear, allowing a higher level of performances with fewer items. Next is risk slim, which stands for risk calibrated super sparse linear integer model. It is essentially a logistic regression subject to L0 regularization and integer constraints solved by using its own cutting plane optimization method. It will produce transparent and interpretable scoring tables like you can see right there. We limited the number of features in each table to be no more than five so that the models are easy to use in practice. You just add up the points and you get a score and the score translates into risk. Next is the explainable boosting machine, which is an algorithm developed by the interpretable machine learning team at Microsoft. It incorporates techniques such as boosting and bagging into training traditional generalized additive models with uh, fewer interaction terms. It doesn't really satisfy sparsity as the models use all the input features, but each feature can be visualized in an interactive dashboard, which is nice. The model also performs really well. Um, we'll skip the explanation of how this one works since it might take a little while, and we'll talk about the prediction results from both baseline and interpretive models next. We we'll present the Kentucky results here, but the main conclusions apply to the Brower results as well. As for the baseline models, the simple models performed similarly to the complex models, which suggests that the features we generated explain the problem quite well. You can see that in the figure because all the AOC levels for all the algorithms in the plots are pretty similar to each other. More importantly, we observed that the best interpretable models can perform approximately as well as the best black box models with the differences in average AUC around 1%. But the interpretable models possess significant advantages of being transparent, allowing users to understand, trust, and use the models. After we examined the prediction results within each region separately, like I showed on the previous slide, we examined how well the predicted models generalize across different regions. We saw that Arno PSA is being implemented in many states as it is, without any retraining or feature adjusting. We hypothesized that this might not be a good idea because different regions could have very different populations, prosecution practices, and even different climates, which all could impact the nature of the data and the power of predictive models. To examine whether each region would benefit from its own trained models, we trained machine learning models on Broward data and test on Kentucky data, and vice versa. Not surprisingly, we found significant drops in AUC when we did this. For instance, we show the results from XGBoost in the table. When we train on Brower and test on Kentucky, there's a 7% drop in the performance compared with models trained and tested on Kentucky only. When we saw that different regions seem to have different statistical properties, we expected the marginal probability distributions of some features for both locations to see if they're really different. For instance, age is a really important factor in recidivism prediction. We plotted the probability of recidivism as a function of age in both locations, and we observed that these curves were drastically different. In Broward, the probability tends to decrease as a function of age until age 50 when the estimates become unreliable because we don't have much data for the older people. In Kentucky, the probability peaks in the mid-30s, which is different from the Broward. So we concluded that specific recidivism prediction models should be constructed for each region separately. Let's switch gears to talk about whether the recidivism prediction models are fair. We looked carefully through the algorithmic fairness literature 
and found that most of the fairness metrics were limited to binary decisions, yes or no. But we are providing risk assessments instead. This limited us to three fairness metrics, calibration, balanced the positive or negative class, and balanced the group AUC. We assessed the fairness on the two-year general recidivism pr uh, problem on three interpretable models with the Kentucky data. And we examined these fairness metrics on both race and gender attributes. Note that the theoretical fairness definitions require some um, measurements to be exactly equal between some groups, which is difficult to achieve realistically. Therefore, we set a threshold of 3% to decide whether or not the models approximately satisfy the fairness definitions. And I'll pass on to Faroz to discuss the fairness results. Thank you, Ben. The first fairness metric we'll examine is calibration. There are two types of calibration. The first, group calibration, requires that for all predicted scores, the fraction of positive labels is the same across all groups. Essentially, a given risk score holds the same meaning for each race. In practice, since there's a small number of individuals for each score value, it is common to bin the scores when computing the fraction of positive labels for a score value. The second type of calibration, monotonic calibration, requires that for two scores, the fraction of positive labels for the lower score should be lower than the fraction of positive labels for the higher score. Essentially, if the score increases, then the risk also increases. The calibration plot of a perfectly calibrated model would be the line x equals y. Like Ben described earlier, the plots on this slide show the calibration results of the Arnold PSA in the form of its NCA raw score, as well as the EBM and risk slim interpretable models. As we can see, the Arnold NCA raw score does not satisfy monotonic calibration for race or gender groups because none of the curves are monotonically increasing, although we admittedly might not have, have enough data at the really high values of the score for the non-monotonicity to matter. For EBM, apart from the other group, the calibration curves are monotonically increasing and approximately equal to each other, which means it satisfies monotonic and group calibration. By a similar argument, risk slim is approximately group calibrated and monotonically calibrated. Balance for positive and negative class, or BPC and BNC, says that given the class, for example, y equals one or y equals zero, the expected value of the score should be the same across all groups. In other words, the individuals who recidivate should approximately all get the same score no matter their race or sex, and the individuals who didn't recidivate should also approximately get the same score no matter their race or sex. From the first bar plot, we can see that the Arnold NCA satisfies neither B BNC nor BPC on gender or race groups. The second shows that EBM satisfies both metrics on race groups, but only BNC on gender groups. The third shows that risk slim satisfies both fairness metrics on race and gender groups. The last fairness metrics we consider is balanced group AUC, which requires that the AUC of the risk score, our performance metric, is the same for each group. Like before, we determine whether the models satisfy this criterion using a 3% rule. In the chart, if you include the other race, as the race range shows, the maximum difference between the three groups is clearly greater than 3%. However, if you exclude the other race, we find that all models actually do satisfy balanced group AUC for both race and sex. This chart summarizes the results from the previous slides. Notice how only risk slim satisfies each fairness criteria for both race and gender groups. This is interesting because risk slim models are also the easiest to understand and use. This indicates that risk slim is very promising for future work in developing customized risk scores for different locations. Next will be Caroline with a discussion of future work. Thanks, Faroz. Some things we can investigate in the future include, first, joint optimization for fairness and interpretability. During this project, we realized that post-processing and pre-processing approaches for fairness don't really work very well with interpretable models because they often involve non-interpretable transformations of either the inputs, the features, or the outputs, which are the scores. Second, we wanted to investigate why many of the models tended to perform better on short-term outcomes, six months, versus the longer-term outcomes, two years, which is something we saw when we were training the interpretable and black box models. Finally, we want to look at creating customized risk scores for each location. One of our main results showed that models don't do very well when they're used in a location they weren't trained on, but most of the models out there today are actually used in a variety of locations. And that's all we have for today. Thank you for watching this presentation.